I love you guys so much. If you're wondering who I'm talking about, it's all of you. It's the ones that just walked off the platform, and it's all of you too. It's so cool to me to see so many of you that are stepping back in the room, uh, that are that are coming back. I'm meeting. I mean, I'm almost overwhelmed by all the new people in the room. Can I just share something with you on the front end? Let me do this. I think this will help. You know, as we prepare for Easter, these are crazy, crazy times. And like nobody, you know, every, every conversation is a little bit different. Um, and even as folks are re-engaging and that kind of thing, and there's no question that we continue to have more folks every week, and I'm thrilled by it. I think it's great. Um, we have an overflow space that we've kept rolling, and usually there's like nobody that wants to go to the overflow space, which is great. We're going to have two of those Easter Sunday. We'll have two services Easter Sunday, 8, 15, and 10 a.m. But one of the things that I need you to help me with um, it, it's hard. It's going to be hard for us, even with those that are helping us as hosts, to identify which families want to sit closer and which families don't. All right? And I'm not going to ask you to do something goofy like wear a red coney hat if you don't want anybody anywhere close to you. But if you don't mind sitting, like in the future, sitting next to the person or within a seat or so of the person next to if you just go ahead and slide up next to them in a nice, not awkward kind of way, that would help us. If you are able and don't mind sitting closer to the front, that also would help us. Um, Y'all were so grateful to sit on the front row, but there's still spaces between, uh, between my friends at the, the Chelises and, 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 and us. And, the, uh, and so y'all are welcome to come to the front. Um, am, I, am I making some sense to you? Because when people are coming in at the end, here's what I know. More than the normal folks that want to sit in the back, there's a group of folks that feel like it's safer from a germ standpoint somehow in the back. I don't understand all that because there's more people back there than up here. But you kind of get what I'm asking you for. Don't sit on the end. Sit towards the middle if you can. All those kind of things to help us be able to help you. I also just want to throw this out there to you. Some of you are like, man, Easter's going to be slammed, jammed. I ain't coming because there's going to be too many people. You are not off the hook. <laughs> it is okay to have that plan. I really feel like God's going to bring plenty of folks that day. But we need your help probably to host a premier party online, to invite some friends that you know that still aren't in a position to get out, that aren't engaged in a church anywhere, to come with you. There's some folks that need a nudge to come, but there's another group of folks that just need a nudge to watch. They need some hope. They're going to sit home alone and be grumpy all Easter. And just because you don't come that day doesn't mean you don't have any obligation. See, that's the crazy thing about this world we live in. You're still responsible for knowing the message, even if you weren't here that day. And you're still responsible for sharing the gospel and encouraging others, um, even on a day like Easter in a COVID kind of world. Does that make sense to you? Now, I'm telling you that. We're expecting 1,000 Easter. We are. We split it between the two rooms. We got almost 700 chairs in the room, 650-something, something something like that. We've run more than 1,000 before, but I really think there'll be some folks that'll, that'll stay put because. But I also know there are more and more people coming. We were up by 40 last Wednesday night over the week before, and I didn't say anything about Wednesday night. I, don't, I guess that proves that I don't have to tell you what we're having for dinner for it to, to matter. Um, but it's, it's growing. Praise Jesus. Anybody happy it's growing? A little bit happy scroll. Um, I'm just going to jump in, can I? I, I I've got to figure out how to, what to do with all the extra stuff that I have every week that I don't have time to give you because there's way too much, and I'm going to try to focus a little bit today, but even then I can't promise. But I'm going to try to give you the right amount today. Um, but we're going to jump right in and talk about really the difference between mind and emotions. And honestly, some of you would prefer that I delineate the difference more than I'm going to. You thought that I'm somehow going to tell you how the, uh, this is the, the exact parameters of the mind and exact parameters of the mo- emotion. Maybe if you've been watching the last few weeks, you already know that the imbalance in most any of the things we've talked about is going to create a problem. You know, God is completely and sovereignly divine, but he requires of us a personal surrender to him. We learn that about salvation, right? And so in a similar way, It is very, very difficult, in fact, probably impossible from our perspective to be able to separate mind and emotion where one begins and the other ends, particularly because science can't fully comprehend how everything works in the mind and the emotions as well. 
This idea between logic or reasons and feelings. And, and we have some ideas. I can give you some into I can I can share with you some, some wisdom. But at the end of the day, the fact is God created us as a whole person. And I want to, if I can, just start with a pie chart. Can I give you a pie chart? Some of, this, some of you have little ones, and this will be a great thing for you to share later and talk about math, right? Y'all remember pie charts and math? Um, but as, I, as we're looking at the pie chart, you say, why you got a pie chart? I'm going to ask you a question. How much of you do you think God wants? How much does he want to? That's good. How much do you think he wants to be in charge of? What compartments of your life do you think he desires to be about? I got hands going up. Everybody knows all of you, right? We naturally know that to be compartmentalized as we surrender to God does not make any sense at all. In fact, it is hard. It's impossible to make the Christian life work as long as you are living a schizophrenic spiritual existence. You say, well, what do you mean? I mean, you're trying to live one life when you're at church and you're living one life at home and trying to juggle both of those when you see people that were with you this day, but now, now they're here with you in class and you don't, how do you make all that work? I'm just going to tell you, can we simplify life? I want to simplify in general. I don't know about you. Just follow God. Just live all of life for him and by him and through him. Acknowledge your imperfection in the middle of all of it. Repent when you're wrong. Right? Live life humbly, knowing that all of us, didn't we learn a few weeks ago, we're wretches and we are his workmanship. In Christ, we are his workmanship. But yes, we're still sinful. And so there's this picture of how do these two fit? And in many ways, there's this discussion about how these things fit within worship. Well, I just want to tell you, you can throw the pie chart. I mean, you don't have to throw the pie chart away. But really, it's just one big circle, and he's in all of it. And really, I, I struggled a lot. I wanted to give you an image, but I... I think a sphere would be more like, like if you could, I mean, our life is full of so much more detail and dimension than we could really ever articulate, and God wants every bit of it. It was God that gave us emotions. Sometimes we're like, well, emotions are bad. You can't trust your feelings. You can't completely trust your feelings all the time. You can't. But what your desire should be is that they would be informed by the Word of God that creates thoughts that then lead to feelings. This is one of my bullet points I wanted to get to. I haven't even given you the text yet, but just in case I don't come back. The scriptures literally teach us that thoughts drive how we feel about things. And so if our feelings are not what we desire for them to be, then we're going to have to work at the thought process. In other words, we read God's word, and as a Christian, being informed by God's word, surrendering to him means trusting more than anything what his word teaches, letting that instruct our thoughts, and then knowing that those thoughts over time are going to instruct our beliefs and our feelings about the isness of the things. If we took it into a marriage relationship or a romantic relationship, the truth of the matter is that the feelings that you have are based on thoughts that came first and, and actions that were driven to, to a feeling that's an ooey-gooey, Twitter-pated kind of feeling. You ever been Twitter-pated? Some of you are like, huh? Man, if you're not... If you're not nearly a grown adult. I hope you've never been. I just do. Um, but if you've ever watched, are we still allowed to say the word Bambi? Has that been, is that on the list of movies we can't watch? If you wonder what is Twitter painted and you watch the movie Bambi and you see little Bambi grow up and all of a sudden as a, as a, a boy deer, uh, he looks at the girl deer and all of a sudden he loses his ever loving mind. That's Twitter painted. That's something that every marriage, married couple ought to have. If you don't get Twitter painted before you get married, you're probably marrying the wrong person. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that the, oh boy, this is a squirrel, but, uh, you know, arranged marriages probably work at a greater rate than not arranged marriage. But here's, here's the deal. Generally, if our actions and thoughts in relationship are right on the front end, it leads to feelings that are, that are positive, feelings that are good, and when we cease to do those actions that were created by those thoughts, then all of a sudden we have the belief that we're not loved anymore, and then we feel like we're not loved. So how do you fix it? Jesus said in Revelation to the church, you've left your first love, go back and do and love me the way you loved me at first. That's a paraphrase. Remember from whence you came. Remember from where you have fallen. So thoughts... Could we say that, that, that the mind and reason is more important than emotion? I don't, we could, but the, the fact is feelings also identify in us places that need to be reevaluated. They're warning signals. 
Sometimes we have feelings that we know aren't godly. And it forces us to ask the question, okay, where is it? And I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Where do I need to go back and offer forgiveness? Where is it that this feeling is so much out of kilter with what I know God's Word teaches? Lord, what are you trying to adjust in my life? What is it that I need to go back and get made right? Where do I need to repent? What do I need to remove from my life? What boundaries need to be put up? What conversations need to be had? But feelings can be a tricky thing. You know, I want to begin, if I can, by giving you a a text that I think sums up much of what we're going to say today because there's a lot of the in-between parts that will be in a lot of different places, and hopefully some part of that will connect with where you are as an individual and the things that are going on in your life. And you just need to, I want to keep saying this out loud so that you hear me say this, Nobody, I say nobody, I, 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 I'm a words of affirmation guy. I appreciate attaboys, and I'm not saying that because I'm fishing for a, a compliment at the end. I'm not. I'm saying that because if you don't like what I'm fixing to say, you need to know that the reason I'm saying it is not necessarily for the attaboys because I love you. But if it does meet a need, if it is polished, if it does, that's great. But neither the music or anything we've done up to this point, nor the word itself, is designed for you to walk away and say, I liked that, or that was good. The design, it's not even for you to say, I agree that those people he talked about are doing that. No, it's so that you could evaluate in your own heart and your own life in a moldable way what the Word of God says, where your thoughts and feelings are versus where they need to be. Then you could lay that in complete surrender before the Lord and have a fresh start. Knowing that you and the Lord are right come, come Monday morning, come Sunday afternoon. Could you have been in complete relationship with God without this time together? Yeah, you could have, but they'd have probably been a mess. Like, like there's some stuff that would have been, maybe been unresolved. My prayer is that you'd be better spiritually because of this time together. Does that make sense? Compliments are always welcome. Criticism, yeah, constructive is good. But I want you to hear the point of actually worshiping the Creator is that we would give Him the worth that He is due and then allow His Word to sanitize our hearts, to flavor our spiritual life, to help us to sift oftentimes the feelings and the thoughts that we're having if we're not careful that we're getting covered up with. So let me give you the text. Mark chapter 12, it's not a new text, but it is a text that speaks directly at reason or mind versus feelings or emotion. As it relates to us individually, it's a conversation Jesus was having with scribes and Pharisees. It was a part of a greater dialogue with other issues. And finally, one hot shot, I don't know what else to call him. He never spoke real positively toward the Pharisees of the day, but one that thought he was particularly able to uh, trip up Jesus because he was really leaving him speechless. He came up and he heard that there was a dispute and and that all of it was answered well. And so he asked Jesus this question about which is the most important commandment of all. And I'm going to start in verse 29. It says, Jesus answered, the most important is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is out of Deuteronomy 6. It's called the Shema. Every Jewish boy and girl would learn this, memorize it from childhood. So he's paraphrasing that. And he says, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said he is one, and he is no other besides him. There is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all understanding, with all strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings, and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God, and no one dared ask him any more questions. Jesus spent much of his ministry, as I more and more, like I love where I'm at in my life. Is it okay to love where I'm at in my life? I love where I'm at in my life study-wise with the scriptures because I have a general concept of what much of the scriptures teach. I've read all of it more than once. I'm not saying that to amaze you or wow you. I've forgotten more than I remember, probably. And I still have to go look. You may ask me about, like I'm some kind of trivia box. I don't excel in quick wit and trivia. I know where to find all of it. What I excel at is taking 
big pieces of God's Word, looking at the patterns at play, looking at the truth of God's Word, and then identifying how those systems, how that applies to every day. It's the practicing, uh, the practice of being a believer in Jesus Christ. Like, the practical side of how do you take what God has said and make it work daily. What I'm seeing is this. If you go back and read the Gospels, and I know some of you, and I'm encouraged by it, you've been reading the Bible, like you've picked it up and you've started reading it for the first time. When you read the Gospels and all of Jesus' interactions, you're going to find that he was frustrated with all the stuff that man had added over a long period of time to what God originally said. Jesus was frustrated with all the extra limitations, all the extra theological understandings, the boundaries, the fences, all these other things that they'd, they'd put words into God's mouth. And Jesus, you're going to find him simplifying a bunch of that stuff. You're going to find him shaving things off. He spent an inordinate amount of his time that he spent with church leaders talking to Pharisees and Sadducees about how they were wrong and what they thought God said and God meant with the Old Testament word. We have talked here before about the huge volumes that had been put forth in the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament that were an understanding of how the Old Testament was applied to all of life. And that actually carries way over way beyond to this day. If you go to Israel, at least it was that way a couple years ago when we went there, if you're there on the Sabbath, if you're there on a Saturday in Israel, the elevator will not allow you to push a button. It's going to stop at every single floor. The doors will open. It'll close. It'll go to the next floor. Why? Because it would be a sin to do the work of pushing the button on the elevator because that's what God meant when he said to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Really? I kind of thought that meant that God created the Sabbath for man and that we were supposed to uh, honor the Lord God. And I didn't realize there was an innumerable, an infinite amount of things we were told not to do. Some of you are like, preacher, where are you going with all this? I'm telling you that Jesus struggled with the complexity that was added to something that he meant for all men to know and embrace and to understand. And I don't mean this with any callousness, but most people are not as smart as you. Most people are not able to memorize everything that they've ever heard, add all the weight of what the past experiences are and the things that you should think they should be doing compared to what others think they should be doing so that they fit within our little pharisaical boxes. And the truth is that all of us have some level of hypocrisy in us. Like, we are naturally built to add on things. I know, I know you guys, I love you guys, and I, but I know you. And I'm not pointing at you like, I know you're hypocrite. No, 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 no. I know that you like as a group small government. Don't raise your hand if you don't, okay? Not in this room. I mean, it'd be like raising your hand and hoping you're the one that, you know, the one person not carrying a weapon today. I mean, that's just, that's, this is Northwest Florida. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> Am I allowed to say that or should I not? I don't have one, I'm just saying. But here's what, what I know to be true. Sincerely hear me. What I know to be true, we think small government's a good thing as a group. We think that simple is better. That man ought to be given freedom to act as his creator instructs him and is according to, to how it fits to the word. So why then do we create religious systems that are more and more and more complex over time that do nothing but add extra steps and hoops to jump through. Because isn't every law the government ever created as it gets added on to? I mean, isn't anybody tired of the tax code? Anybody? I mean, does anybody not see that the... I mean, have you, have you signed for a house lately? Or even a car? Like, just to buy... I mean, you want to pay cash for a car. You've got, a, I don't know how many, but it's a bunch of signatures. Why? Rule on top of rule on top of rule. Give us just a few minutes, man. We can make anything complex. Can I tell you the trend in church life, in God's kingdom? We take simple gospel, we make it complex to the point that I don't think our Savior even recognizes it anymore. And so here's, some of you are like, wait a minute, preacher. You're like talking it. I'm absolutely talking different than I've ever taught before because I see, I see a framework that is incumbent upon us if we are to give gospel, like legit gospel, 
then we don't get to make a bunch of framework that, that doesn't fit the heart of God. Where do you think we got denominations from? I know what I believe. I'm not ashamed of what I believe. I'm not walking back from anything that I literally believe the text says. But it's been year after year, generation after generation of norms that have been created and espoused and been dogmatic and everybody thinks they got it figured out. The only thing that's dogmatic is that Jesus is the only way unto salvation. And like I think that you also believe that the whole concept of making complex, that which Jesus made simple, is ridiculous. And so let me tell you with confidence, we are for Christ and in Christ first and everything else is merely leftovers. Like it matters that we trust in him for salvation, that we recognize that this is what is crazy. Like we even get some of you, if you were honest, again, I know you, you came from a conservative background. And so what does that even mean? Explain that preacher. You came from a, a background that was full of tradition. Some of you did. Some of you came from a Pentecostal background. That's not a knock. I'm just saying you know how to move better than the rest of us. You had drums in your church from the early days. <laughs> you know, drums weren't always allowed. Electric guitars not either. Those things were. There's, there's a lot of other things in church you used to not be allowed. I, they didn't even. It used to be a bad thing to have a chair that was cushy to sit in. Praise the Lord, we dumped that out the window someday and realized that wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> Anybody thankful they got a soft seat? <laughs> See, this is good. Things have progressed. Anybody like air conditioning? There you go. So when they say your church looks like the culture, therefore it's not like Jesus, you might say, wait a minute, what part of culture are you talking about exactly? Let, let's, let's clear this up. Because the, the reality is that, you know, as we, as we look at how God's word has been applied to church and to life, in the worship, we just keep adding and adding and adding. The scriptures tell us that Jesus wanted us to trust in him for salvation. And then we've added some stuff. You come from the conservative background that I was describing with lots of denominational stuff. If you come from a Catholic background, there's lots of tradition. Lots and lots and lots of tradition. And I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but one of the major issues, I, Baptists have some issues, right? One of the major issues with the Catholic faith is they put tradition before the Bible. That's a problem. That's a problem. And I'm not here to point out what all the issues are today. I'm just telling you it's a problem. The Episcopalians are about that far from the Catholics. And so you walk into their churches and they have got tradition everywhere. I'm not saying it's horrible or bad or wrong. Just don't tell me that because we've got chairs and don't have all this decorative stuff everywhere and stained glass and all these other things that came in a thousand years after the time of Jesus Christ that somehow we love Jesus less because that don't fly because that ain't in the Bible. Meanwhile, I'm not looking at people that truly love Jesus that are Episcopalian or even Catholic if they trusted Christ, right? Some of you are going to argue with me. Don't do that. I'm just telling you that we take modes and decorations and traditions and we elevate that to be something that God cares about as if what Jesus said about the phylacteries and the way that they dressed so as to espouse them as more important than everybody else. He called it hypocrisy. He said, that's not my heart. So give it a thousand years and I guess to keep control, I guess to keep power, I guess to keep influence, position, money, whatever the reason is in our humanity that we do it, we make it more complex and more complex and more complex and more complex. If you came from that other side, and it's not other side like in looseness of gospel because, man, they can, they can make a tambourine work. But there's t a tendency to actually more towards emotion. What's nuts to me is that so much of what we do is we say that it's based on reason, but it's not based on the Bible. It's based on Tradition that's been added to year upon year upon year upon year. I just don't care about all that anymore. It's hurtful to some for me to say that I don't care about our traditions. I do, just not, not like I care about Jesus. And if I've got a pick, man, we don't have time to argue about all that stuff. Jesus spent a lot of time says, I want it all, man. I want mind, heart, strength, emotion. I want everything. We don't have to pick one versus the other. 
Did you know, I went back and looked a little bit. Did you know that David followed some feelings he shouldn't have with Bathsheba, right? But then Nathan, who praised the Lord, David had a Nathan. David had somebody in his life that he allowed to hold him accountable, whose head he wasn't going to cut off because he was king. And David came in and told him a story that wove into his emotions. And then he got really angry at the man who had been mistreated. And he looked at the prophet Nathan and he said, who is that man? Nathan said, it's you. And it's almost like you can feel. The f I used the word. It's almost like you, 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 you can know that the sense of disappointment. The feeling of failure, the feeling that I messed up, I've been convicted, my conscience is not clear. It hit David and it hit him hard. That was from God. God gave those feelings to David. The feeling in the room when 3,000 were saved that day, it wasn't in a room, it was outside, and they baptized them. Do you think they had goosebumps that day? I'm going to tell you, I bet you they did. If they ever had them, they had them that day. And they all walked away thinking, I hope it never feels any different than this. I hope every day is like this. See, God created us with those emotions. God created like these crazy things that we experience that are the parts that aren't messed up because of sin in our world where you have relationship. And when it's good, it's right, even all the way to Twitter patient. You're like, that's ungodly. No, 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 no. That appetite within the bonds of marriage is holy, y'all. Can y'all say holy? Y'all ain't say it loud enough. Holy. holy. And y'all know exactly what I mean. Praise God, it's good. It's supposed to be God created it that way. He created us in, a, in us a desire to work. But if that comes all the way to the place that we love, the stuff we accumulate more than God, we have allowed an appetite and a desire to be useful and to be prosperous and to do the things God, it gets in the way and it's fulfilled in an ungodly manner. God gave us feelings. But God also gave us a mind. I want to show you that they fell off. I, I, I shared with you last week a historical figure from I think the 15, 1600s is when Charles Spurgeon was around. And I shared with you that he got misquoted, and he does get misquoted often in modern times. Jesus gets misquoted a lot in modern times, too. But I want to encourage you that finding the latest book about the Bible, it's not bad to read it. But I learned about my 10th year in ministry that the next big book that comes down the pipeline at Lifeway is not going to be the beginning of the next great revival just because it's hot off the press, just because... The advertising is polished, and just because somebody spent a bunch of money getting it published and is now piping it and telling everybody they need to use it. At the end of the day, everything about the gospel that matters is right here in the scripture. It's just all about the text. Now, it doesn't mean we can't learn from other things, but I don't want to know what somebody else thinks about the Bible. I want to know what the Bible says. And you should want to know what the Bible says. I'm not telling you to believe what I tell you about the Bible. I'm telling you, go read it. It's in the Bible. And really, if I'm, if I'm trying to give you a goal, those that lean toward the feeling side, and it's all right. But let those feelings be instructed by the grounded Word of God. And those of you that lean toward the mind and reason side of it, make sure that you're looking at all of what God's Word says, and not just the favorite author, but look at the text. Look at the trend, and then acknowledge... Conviction is a real feeling. Joy is a real feeling that comes as a fruit of God's Spirit at work within us. You hear me? I mean, this is not the day that I'm just going to flip tables, but I thought at times during the week as I was processing all this, you know, like if I had a table, it would be good to kind of flip one somewhere and say, what are we doing? Like, why do we get things backwards? We have all these discussions. Here's the crazy part. Like, in what Jesus was saying, love God first, and then he said, the second command is to love others. You remember when we talked about this a few weeks ago, we said, if the vertical's right, the horizontal will be right. Did you know race relations would not be a problem if our relationship with the Lord God was right? Now, we could focus on all of that, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be some discussion. I'm just telling you it's a side issue. A discussion about homosexual, homosexuality is a side issue. 
Is it clear in Scripture? Crystal. Absolutely crystal clear. Just as financial principles are crystal clear. The point at which life begins, crystal clear. There's so many things that there's like no debate on. And yet you don't hear me talk about them all the time. Most of you don't even wonder where I'm at on them. You know where I'm at on them. It should be music to your ears to know that whatever the next cultural thing is where they want to change this, that ain't happening. But if there's a neutral tool tool available to me to create an environment, to lovingly bring a person to a place of conviction and personal surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel, the real gospel, that he divinely and sovereignty, sovereignly is placed before us, we're going to do it. We're just going to do it. Over the years, I'm old enough now, man, I watched the cassette tapes. Y'all remember cassette tapes? Those are of the devil. You flip them over and then play them backwards, and it's satanic. <laughs> I'm not saying it wasn't, but I am saying that it might have been two people in all the world that we'll ever know that may have ever got possessed by a demon, if that, because of playing the cassette tape backwards. But every teenager that came through any youth group during that entire 10-year period had to hear the lecture on it. I've been a lot better off if I just heard some more gospel. In fact, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'd have been better off if they taught me a little more about the Holy Spirit. See, I'm Baptist. It's hard for me to stand down there and do anything. I mean, I'm like, I'm not like a T-Rex. You know what I mean? <laughs> when I worship, I'm naturally, it don't mean I'm in it. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a T-Rex. And some of you come from a, a, you know, some of you, I'm just going to name you. Some of you come from a Presbyterian background. You're more T-Rex than me. I mean, you just look like this. And still not even okay with some of the, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a background thing. Those are preferences and choices. Like you realize fashion choices that we debate about with preachers today were not even available when Jesus walked the earth. But he probably would have not have been considered dressed up. And all the issues and rules we want to make up with that beyond modesty is just made up stuff. It's just made up stuff. I'll be telling our key leaders in a minute, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't tell you now, but we got a thousand t-shirts that are being made up for Easter. They got a logo on the front and they got hashtag good news bay on the back. I want to tell you loud and proud, I'm not asking you to wear those Easter. In fact, I don't want you to wear those Easter. I want you to wear what you'd normally wear on Easter. I know who you are. Most of you don't wear a t-shirt to, to, to church. Don't wear it. Easter. Wear it everywhere else. Everybody in here knows what Good News Bay is. Everybody out there doesn't. But we make up this stuff, it doesn't matter. I'm not spending any more time talking about who's wearing what, as long as it's modest. It's just, it, you can do what you want to do. Just don't make up made-up stuff. And I'm going to call it made-up stuff, because some of it is. Do you know I made up a word, and I don't, I don't aggravate, so it's not my intent to aggravate. I just want to communicate. We all have some of this in us. <laughs> or it's hypocrite. See, a regular plain old hypocrite, the Greek is the term of putting a mask and pretending to be somebody that you're not. It comes out of the term for theater. This comes out of the church world. It's assigning worth and value to God as though he is valuable to you, but not giving him your whole life. It's singing with hands in the air or maybe the old T-Rex style that I carry, but not living a life that's personally surrendered. It's compartmentalizing life so that it's all right to do things a certain way in a room lit the certain way because that's, quote, holy on Sunday. But the same room with lyrics that aren't about Jesus in an intoxicated setting while I get lectured to about its holiness or lack thereof on Sunday when it's for Jesus and not intoxicated, the legends sing about it, and somehow that's worse hypocrisy. That's harsh. But at some point, we just got to say we're moving on. We're, mo we're, mo we're moving on. You say, well, that's all. It's, it's, it's about them. Anybody watch a Gaither vocal band concert? It's only not okay whenever people up here in a more dimly lit room get a standing ovation. Because then it's all about them. But you let a Southern Gospel Quartet go at it, and their cufflinks, their greased back hair, real expensive charter bus, and they're anointed. 
worse hypocrisy. Yeah. You're drunk during the week, and you want to talk to me about how the room is lit. I don't have my whole act together. I'm not trying to be abrasive. I'm telling you, though, that Jesus got sick of spending time while people were dying without Christ, talking about what people were wearing, talking about traditions, stuff that got added on. You don't know this probably because we've been all of these different places. We have begun to look at everything we do as a church, all of it. Why are we doing it? How does it help us to get the gospel to the masses? And if it doesn't help us get the gospel to the masses, why are we doing it? Some of you would love to have a huge egg hunt this year. I'd love to have a huge egg hunt this year, but that's not going to work because that's not the world we live in right now. And that probably wouldn't be wise with all the other things. Oh, you're going to cater. No, I'm not. I just am not going to spend a bunch of time planning something and a bunch of money planning something that the day before somebody says something, we've got to cancel the whole thing. But I did ask the question. We asked it in our staff meeting. Why do we do that? Why do we do that egg hunt thing? Have more people come to Christ because we do the egg hunt? I don't have an answer to that. The more people come Easter Sunday because I don't have an answer to that. What I know is we spent several thousand dollars on it. Year in and year out. Same reason about Fall Festival. You might have loved it, you might have hated it, but at the end of the day, it wasn't helping us accomplish the mission and purpose, so we quit it. Why? Because that ain't the purpose. I'm ecstatic about the micro egg hunts. If you hate them, then hate me because it was my idea. Poor Bridges floating it. But it's good because people are hungry for connection and they want to meet people like real life people. They don't just want to three generations of families who have been around for 20 years to come and hang out just by themselves while all the new people are over here on the other side. And I'm not saying it to be negative, but I'm saying our goal and our purpose as a church is to incorporate new people into the body of Christ. So if you change all these things, then I'm going to lose my position. Wasn't that what Jesus' problem was with the church of his day? Like, let's go farther than we've ever gone before to do the thing that we've been called to do to share the gospel is it mind or is it emotion I mean it's both in case you haven't heard me say it already I am a hundred thousand percent committed to the integrity of the scripture of God but just because I sit quietly and listen to emotional discussions about feelings on the one side, which I hear, or about certain types of styles that are not okay on the other side, and you feel confident in your approach does not mean that I believe that what you're telling me is dogmatically biblical or gospel-centered. I will smile at you and look at your face and be kind and be gracious, but that does not mean I, I agree. That's okay, right, for us to be civil? And it also doesn't mean that I'm going to change my position. I have a group of elders that I'm accountable to. Praise God for... Could y'all help me thank our elders for letting us be open? Anybody, anybody thankful? Because we don't... The reason we're able to be open is because they have allowed us to be open. It matters. Um, I don't know what, which cans I'm opening, but you know what's crazy? It is so freeing to me to know that I've got a calling to this gospel. Like, that's it. That's, that's just, that's it. Uh, an obligation to encourage, an obligation to speak truth, an obligation to not treat you differently based on your last name or your financial status. Do you know it aggravates some people that I don't treat them special because of who they are and what their last name is? Did you know that? I mean, I don't know that they ever just come out and say it, but like, that's weird. But that's the town we live in. That's the world. I love our town. I love our town. But don't make me make the gospel something it's not. Let's not do that. But isn't it gratifying to think that we just want pure gospel? Here's what it also means. It means that when you come in here, hypocrites like all of us, because we all are, it means that you can come in here and worship Jesus, knowing that you, yes, knowing that you failed this week. But not that it is a grace to be abused, but it is a, a gift that should be built upon. So we're simplifying. 
We've simplified the platform. We're simplifying our programming some. I am so ecstatic that since our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ, like that's what churches do, that's what this church does, we actually want to teach you the Bible. So we got Bible study on Sunday morning. We got Bible study on Wednesday nights. I want to have more and more Bible study classes. There's a lot of things that aren't bad things we've done. It. I don't have any desire to do all that. It's not ungodly, just neutral. I'm going to need y'all's help, though. Isn't this the way to ask for help? You punch them in the gut, and then you say, hey, would you help me? <laughs> I, in the coming weeks, help me change the conversation. You think it's a small thing when you say something neutral about gas prices. I don't, only, I don't even keep bringing it up because I've seen it like 500 times this week. For every negative thing you post, why don't you post 10 that aren't? Tell you what, I'd be happy with one-to-one. -one. Every conversation that you have, can you be intentional to post something positive? Thoughts drive feelings. Word drives. You say, how do you know that? Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Verse 8 talks about things that are praiseworthy, admirable, whole list of them. You think on these things, you'll have peace. Peace is a feeling that comes from God that's supernatural when we put our mind on things that are from him. I've totally missed all of Philippians 3. I can't give it all to you. But let me tell you what happened. In the first part of Philippians chapter 3, Paul talked to a group of people as he articulated to them how much of a Pharisee he was, born and raised, bell to bell. They were a group of people who thought because they had been circumcised as Jews and as Christians, they could hold that standard for everybody else and that they would have to hold it too. They were pious, they were legalistic, and they were adding to the gospel. Then he reminded them to forget what lies behind and to press on to what, toward what lies ahead. And in the end of that chapter, see that's one end of it where we are so mind-focused, we add, we add, we add, and we're thinkers. On the back side of it, the tradition, all that's on the front. He speaks to another group. Not 100% sure if this group was the Antimonians or the Gnostics, some version thereof. Some of you says, what is that? Well, some have said defining the Gnostics about like nailing a flopping fish to the wall. It's just hard. They weigh feelings too much. They weigh feelings too much. And so they say, I feel like God would not think it's a big deal if I do such and such. That's where you messed up. You just said you felt like God would. You didn't base it on Scripture. And at that point, you need, to, you need to make your feelings match the word. If you say, I feel like God doesn't care how many wives I have. Well, I know one that cares how many I got. <laughs> but, but I also know the word's pretty, pretty clear on it. You know, I don't think God would want me to say no to this business deal because it would cost me a lot of money, and he wants me to be able to give a lot of money to the church, and so if I say yes to this, then so I think God would want me to be a little, just a little bit shady right here. Um, you need to rethink that feeling you're having, because I'm pretty sure that's not how God feels. You see what I'm saying? Sift your feelings with the word. To do that, you got to get word. You need to be around people that will lovingly be a Nathan in your life. Would you let me be that? I'm not perfect. You can be mine one day too, just not out loud in front of everybody. Um, <laughs> like I'm open. Just let's make it biblical. As we move forward, the world has changed. I see people in here today that I have never seen in my life before. Some of whom found us on Google. They found us on Facebook. They found us on social media. I'm going to ask you very directly to help me with something. I don't even know. I was going to save this for my leaders, but you're them. You're deputized. As hard as you work to push out all the political social media stuff on both sides, if you're still there, would you give that same effort to help me get the gospel out about Jesus? Is that a fair ask? If you hate what you see, it's okay. I, I don't, don't, I mean, don't, don't, if you don't believe in it, it's all right. I'm just asking you to be that committed to the gospel. You say, no, but I'd rather share my faith in person. Man, get after it. Yeah, I'll take the trade off. 
but I need your help. It does make a difference. It changes the conversation. So I'm not on social media. Praise God you're not. Would you invite some people? Would you encourage some people? Would you keep the good news? Would you let me change the conversation? There's enough people in this room we can change the conversation. There's enough people in this room we can be a part of a movement that is way bigger than us. That's not about a pastor. It's not about a denomination. And God, in some weird kind of way, has uniquely positioned us as a church to do it. He just has. And I can't wait to get after it. It starts with personal surrender. Personal surrender. Let's pray. Father, it is my heart's desire that we would see the world the way that you see the world. And Lord, I've got much to learn. But I know that historically, God's people have fallen off one or both sides of that equation of reason and emotions over the years. We have made ardent enemies over lesser things. Lord, I I don't know of any conviction that I've really laid down that I've ever had. But I have learned that as a believer in Jesus Christ, your greatest desire is not for one denomination or one church to grow a kingdom or a fiefdom. Lord, it's our desire to dedicate ourselves to you, to honor you in how we do life. And I pray that in some, some way, maybe the directness of the message today would allow us to focus. It would allow us to align every part of our ministry, every part of our church, with a single-minded focus to share the gospel. Lord, we've had two this week that have come to us saying, how may I accept Christ? May there be many, many more. And when they do, I pray, Father, that we would teach them the gospel that we would teach them to follow you, that the rest of their week is going to look different because of the Jesus that they received. Lord, we love you and we trust you. We are grateful for this day. For if any have not chosen Christ, I pray for personal surrender. And I pray, Father, that as we renew this week, there would be personal surrender, a fresh move from you of your Holy Spirit in our life even now during this, uh, this final, I guess, song as we reflect and reconnect and give it all to you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Stand together with me as we, uh, as we sing. <laughs>